last week was Easter. And I talked about the idea that we are called to stand. And we've been talking about this this year, this idea of take a stand, to stand firm, to stand on the risen hope. Uh, in our life, I asked the question briefly again this week, uh, from last week, in whom or what do you place your hope? We live in a world today that has their hopes and dreams turned upside down. They're wrong. They're looking to the wrong places. They're looking to the wrong people. They're going after the wrong things. And somehow or another, they keep blaming God or finding their relationship with God based upon how good or bad their hopes and dreams are going. That at a drop of a hat, they can change their attitude of who God is because of a circumstance or a situation. An illness. See, my hope comes from the source of all hopes. And for us today, as, as Paul prayed uh, back to the, to the church in Romans chapter 15, it says, I prayed that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Our joy and our peace is not based on and will never be based on and can never be based on the circumstances of our life. If we wait for the circumstances of our life to be perfect, then we will inevitably rob someone else of their joy and their peace because your perfect is never going to be someone else's perfect. Your joy of life will never inevitably ever be someone else's joy. For when you get, someone else loses. It's always been that way and it will always be that way. The idea that if I have all I want, then everybody else should be happy too, it just doesn't work. All we have to do is open our eyes and start telling someone something negative happening in our life. And I promise you, they'll tell you something worse going on in their life. And then you two will start a contest with each other about who's got the worst pains in life between each other. And then some new person will walk up who doesn't even have anything to do with the conversation and show both of you how wrong you are. We all want things to go well in life. We all want to have the two and a half kids with the three and a half dogs and the, and the two cats and the picket fence and, you know, everybody comes in and the the hamburgers on the grill are never burnt, you know. Everything is just hunky-dory all the time. And, and that's what we strive after. But see, our confident hope comes from God. It doesn't come in these things. And I say this, and for some, we're sitting here going, of course, but yet we live our life as if the circumstances of our life determine our relationship with God. We, we look as if the circumstances are an indicator to us of how my relationship with God is. And it's just not true. See, Jesus asked the question, who do you say that I am to Peter? And Peter replied, you are the Messiah. And Jesus is asking us, and he continues to ask us, but who do you say I am? See, in whom or what do you place your hope? The circumstances of my life never determine my relationship with Jesus, good or bad. See, oftentimes we call someone blessed when something good happens. Oh, they're blessed they got over the sickness. They're blessed because they were in an accident and they were unharmed. They're blessed because they got out of that financial situation. They're blessed and we call all these blessings upon people's lives. And, and they're blessed of God. God is good to them all the time. We say all the time God is good. And it's based upon circumstances. 
And because a good circumstance happens, then everything's good with God. And then all of a sudden, a bad circumstance happens, and we wonder, where is God? What, what did he do? What, why? What did I do to deserve this? Well, what's happening? And because of the circumstance, my relationship with God starts this ebb and flow, this up and down of, hey, it's good, it's bad, it's I don't know. A lot of times our relationship with God is based upon our emotions. We call it our heart. Have you ever told someone, just follow your heart? It'll never fail you. I don't know if you've seen other people's emotions, but they lie. Not the person, but your emotions. The Bible tells us this about our heart. In Jeremiah chapter 17, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked, your heart. So every time somebody says, hey, go follow your heart. What? If you follow your heart, it can lead you down the wrong path. Because your emotions tell you something does not mean it's true. Have you ever been in a painful situation and all of a sudden your emotions say, I'm all alone? It's a lie. God doesn't love me. Look at what's going on. If he loved me, this would change. It's a lie. Our emotions, our heart is deceptive. So when we look at it and we say, and, and I know some people, I know we live in the 21st century and, and everything's changing, but, but it used to be, you know, back in the day when, when I was younger that, uh, that, that girls were a little more emotional based. Man, they were logical thinkers, so if you thought logically, then you must be better, right? See, the Bible tells us that the heart is deceptive. And we know that God is going to search all of our hearts and examine us. But let's think about this ideal of logic, of philosophy. Because if I go through it and say, well, maybe I'm not thinking about it with my heart. Maybe I'm thinking about it with my brain. And I'm smart enough to figure everything out. Well, here's what the Bible says. And it intertwines the heart with it. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, it says, trust the Lord with all your what? The very most deceptive thing of your life, right? Now all of a sudden, now I've thrown in that the heart is deceptive. But the reality is every emotion you have, whether it's good, bad, or indifferent, who are you to trust with that? The Lord. So whenever I'm thinking things are going bad, who do I still trust? When I think things are going good and my emotions are all happy, who do I trust? See, it doesn't matter what my heart tells me. I choose to trust God. But then I look at the logic side of things and it says, do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do and he will show you which path to take. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Every one of us have a philosophy of life. We either are more moved by our emotions and that's how we react and act towards other people or we're more moved with our brain and how we think and how we, how we feel and in the sense of my philosophy on life and how I'm going to treat others. And the Bible tells me I'm not to trust my heart and I'm not to trust my own wisdom. So if I'm left with no heart, no emotion to trust and I'm left with no logic to be able to trust, what do I trust? See, with this logic and philosophy, there's a very important set of verses. I encourage you to read the totality of, of chapter 1 of, of 1 Corinthians. But I read in verse 21, Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom. I'm not going to come to God with my human wisdom. 
I can sit up here every single week. I can send out messages. I can talk to you one-on-one -on -one with human logic and human philosophy, and it will never lead you to God. How do I know that? The Bible just told me. It is not based upon my heart. It's not based upon my wisdom, not my human thinking, because if it was, it would lead me based upon my circumstances, about my dreams, my hopes. I mean, I, I think about it, and I think about my hopes and my dreams for my family. I think about my hopes and my dreams for my children. If it was based upon that, we would all be rising and falling based upon how they act and react on everyday occasions. And if you know your children like I know my children, that is a roller coaster of epic proportions. It, what, Mitchell, it is, isn't it? Yes. It is an up and down. So what do we do? How do we live this out? The Bible says he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. Do you know the number of people that think the things I say are foolish? It would probably astound you. But see, God didn't use human wisdom, human logic. He didn't use schools. He didn't use these things. What we see in wisdom is found in someone in the name of Jesus. It, it is foolishness to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven. And it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. It's much like the world we live in today. When we see and we think and we, and we live out and even Christians today who are in church today still are basing their relationship with God according to how good their, their circumstances are behaving. And if my circumstances are good, then therefore God loves me, I'm blessed, and hallelujah to everybody. But as soon as the circumstances turn south, as we say, where did God go? What is God doing? Why is he doing this to me? Does God not love me? If this is how he's going to be, then I'll just abandon him. But to those who got, are called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles alike, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. So when I stand before you with my human knowledge and, and my human wisdom and my human thinking and my human emotions, and I am a human being filled with emotions, I have sadness, I have happiness, I, I feel mad, I feel glad. It, it's all kinds of emotions that we have, but I understand that all wisdom comes from God. And it is seen in the person of Jesus Christ. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans. And God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only 
about the Lord. On this journey that we're taking this morning, and as you listen to this message, some of you are basing your relationship on God based on your heart, your emotions. Your mo emotions are up and down, up and down, up and down. Some are basing their relationship on God based upon their philosophy, their, their logic, their, their wisdom, their way of thinking, and they're leaning on how they see things. Both of these are faulty. It is as simple as this. Jesus Christ crucified and risen again. That is the hope. There's nothing more and nothing less needed. In this, the Bible tells us that the gift of salvation, salvation is a gift of God. It's a free gift. That makes no sense. We should have to work for it. I mean, think about it. We don't want no participation trophies these days, do we? Well, when it comes to salvation, I want the participation trophy. Because there is no working it. There's no I'm good enough. There's no I'm going to make it on my own. You can't do it. You can't do it on your logic. You can't do it on your emotions. If you think you can, you will fail every time. Because of that, my relationship is based on who he is, not what he does. See, my relationship with God is based on who he is, not what he does. He's already done it. He has to do nothing else for me. He has to do nothing else for me. We live in this world, and, and, and a couple of weeks ago, actually last week, but before that, I was talking to someone about this idea of my hopes and dreams being based on money. And when they heard me say that, they go, yep, I've done named it and claimed it. And they did that. How's that working out for you? Well, I still named it and claimed it. And you clap your hands. I guess it makes it okay. Somebody else sent me a message and said, you believe it, you receive it. If you deny it, you'll never get it or something like that. It rhymed. I don't know what it said. And it's all based upon the reality that people think I like faith in God. They think I like faith because I'm not standing up constantly saying I'm waiting on the miracle for Caitlin. My relationship with God has not been and it will never be based upon what this world can give me. It won't be. It can't be. Because there's more to life than what this world is showing us. It always has and it always will. My wisdom, my emotions don't matter. What matters is faith in a risen Savior who loves us. See, the circumstances of my life don't tell you who God is. If it were true, then everybody will only believe in God when they see the miracle. People will only believe in God when good things happen. Because obviously a loving God would never let something bad happen to us. That's what people say. Again, our wisdom, our logic, our philosophy of life. The Bible tells me about three men named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. See, there was this king, his name was Nebuchadnezzar, and he built this some 90 foot tall statue that was some nine feet wide, gold. Can you imagine? I mean, if the Lord brought me a 90 foot tall image and nine feet wide that was made of solid gold, you and I are melting that down. I'm just telling you. I'll buy a nickel-plated one for much cheaper and keep the finances otherwise, right? But that's what they did. And King Nebuchadnezzar said, you'll bow down for me. And now think about it. The circumstances and situations of life, they determine who God is. That, if that's the way we're going to go about it, and we see this, and, and, and these people come to King ne Nebuchadnezzar and they tell him, wait a minute, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the one you put in charge of things. 
They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. But if they refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what will your God, who's going to be able to rescue you? Who, who's got more power than I do? King Nebuchadnezzar is telling them. I mean, don't you think about that with circumstances of life? They start telling you who's got more power than me. You live with it every day, that ache in your back, that worry of the next doctor's appointment, that financial statement that comes every week, every month, that pain in your life that never lets you go, that keeps telling you all the time, you will bow down to me, you will finally give in, you will finally give up, God is not real and he is not powerful and he's not able. He doesn't love you. Look at your circumstance. Your emotions start taking over. Your logic starts coming in and you start mingling these two together where all of a sudden you question God. And then a preacher stands up and says, wait a minute, it's Christ crucified and risen again. That is our hope. And you all of a sudden go, that's foolish. Yep. It is foolish. See, because wisdom doesn't come from man. Wisdom comes from God. And the Bible tells me that Christ is himself wisdom. What power will you have? The Bible goes on and says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. And in my Bible, I have it highlighted as such. And it says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said those words. And in verse 17, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. I want us to say that word. God is able God is able. He is able. Don't ever deny it. Don't ever think otherwise. Don't think because of the things I say that I don't believe in God and His power. There is no other name by which we can come to God the Father except the name of Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, the life. He is everything. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is wonderful counselor. The everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And when we say Jesus Christ, we have said the biggest mouthful above all mouthfuls. There is no other name by which we can be saved other than Jesus Christ. So know that in this moment when you're living your life and you have the emotions and the wisdom, know that God is able. But why do I like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? It's because of the next words that they say. He is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if, all those E words, even if. They matter to me. Why? Because it tells me no matter what circumstance comes my way, even if the circumstance is bad, I'm still going to serve God. Even if the circumstance hurts me, I'm going to serve God. Even if the circumstance of my life tells me that I'm alone, I'm still going to serve God. Even if, even if, even if, and I'm telling you right now, there's an even if coming your way and God is saying, will you still serve me? Even if. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, but even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up, even if the circumstances of my life never determine my relationship with God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were making that clear to King Nebuchadnezzar when they said, wait a minute, our God is able. Yes, he is able. 
But even if he doesn't, it's not going to change who I'm serving. See, my relationship with God is not based upon what he does for me or what he will do for me. Think about it this way. I think about when I first got into a relationship with Heather. She made me happy to be around. I mean, there was this longing inside that, that said, I, I got to go, uh, go hang out with her. You know, and that was back in the day when you actually went out and hung out with people. Now they just Snapchat with people and they call it hanging out. I don't, I don't know. It. Hey, we're dating. What? Have you even met them? No, we're just talking on Snapchat. I don't understand that either. But go ahead. I'll just go on. That's a daddy starting to come out in me. I don't get it. But I think about it, and oftentimes our marriages are based upon faulty information. They come down to the aisle and they say, do you promise to, to tell the truth? Oh, no, no, that's, that's another thing. What do they tell you you're supposed to do? Do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded, to have and to hold for better in sickness and in health? Until we can't stand each other anymore. <laughs> See, a lot of times our relationship with one another is based upon what they give you at any moment. And if they stop making you feel happy, you start moving away. Because it's based upon what they give you at any time. You know, as I've been preparing this message and thinking about it for the last couple of weeks, especially the last couple of weeks, I was thinking about my relationship with Heather and, and how it's come to the place in my life that, that I see people uh, in my life that I look at and I go, wait a minute, it's not based upon what that person does for them anymore. It's based upon who that person is. See, I think about someone like Morris who, for the last couple of years of his life, it wasn't based upon what someone would give. It's who they were to them. I think about Birdie right now and, and Elmer being at, at, at Red Banks. And, and I think it, it's not based upon what, what you can get. It's a based upon who that person is. See, I think about Carolyn back there and, and, and Fred. And I think about just the, the relationship and, and how I look at it from the standpoint of it's not what I can get but it's who they are. See, the relationship starts changing based upon who the person is, not what they can give me. I mean, I think about my children. The first time I saw Mitchell, and, he, and he's sitting there, and, and, and he was so cute and so adorable. He was a cute one. And I think about what could he give me? Sleepless nights. Yep, check. Stinky divers, check. Yep. Crying attitude when he didn't get food, check. What was he giving me? Well, some people say, well, he's giving you love. No. He was giving me nothing, but it wasn't mattering. I'm not looking to what he's going to give me later on. It was based upon who he was, who he is. He is my child. My relationship with him is never going to be based upon what he does or does not do. My relationship with Caitlin will never be about how good or how bad she is. My relationship is based on who she is. And oftentimes we get it turned upside down and inside out because ultimately our relationship with God is based upon what is he doing for me now. How good or bad are my circumstances and it dictates how I feel about God, my emotions, how I see him. See, it's not based upon what he does for me. My relationship with God is based upon who he is. And in the end, I'm never going to be able to boast about it. You're never going to come back and go, wow, look at this dude. He's the one that showed us the way to Christ. No, Jesus shows us the way to Jesus. He is the way. 
the only way. He is the truth, not a truth. He is the life. He's everything. So the circumstances and the situations of my life, I understand and know that he is able. He is able to make me rich. Yep. He is able to heal my daughter. Yep. As someone told me in my family long ago when Mitchell was first born, he'll grow out of Down syndrome. What? Yeah. Why? Because our basis of relationship with God is based upon what he's done. Can God heal Mitchell of Down syndrome? Yep. Yeah. Can God heal Caitlin? Yep. But I don't need it. Do I want it? Yep. Do I want Birdie and Elmer to walk into these doors again together? Yep. Do I want to see a lot of people that I no longer see? Yep. But my relationship with God is not based upon if he does it or doesn't. It's based upon who he is. And the Bible tells me in Ephesians chapter 3, Now all glory to God, who is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and to Christ, in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. God is able to do infinitely more than you ever ask or think. He is able to do it. But my relationship with him is not based on if he doesn't do it, then this is what I'm going to do. Or if he does it, this is what I'm going to do. I will serve God no matter what this world tells me. That's a determination we have to make. You have to make that determination today because all too often our relationship with God is up and down based on our emotions of the morning, our attitudes of the afternoon, our thinking when we go to bed. But all of those things will lead you down the wrong path. God is God no matter what your heart says. God is God no matter what your philosophy says. God is God no matter what the doctor tells you, what the bank says to you, no matter what your finances say. God is God. And I stand on that risen hope. You see, the circumstances of my life never determine my relationship with God. Even if those circumstances are good, they don't determine my relationship with God. Do I like good circumstances? I love good circumstances. I want good circumstances. I want the Dallas Cowboys to win a Super Bowl too. Kentucky Wildcats to win another NCAA championship. I'm just trying to find common ground with you people. Come on, give me something. You want these things and that's okay. But see, I'm still going to be good with God without those things. If I'm not good without those things with God, if I'm not good with God without those things, I promise you, you won't be good with God with those things. Because those things will become your idol. Do we want those things? Not as much as I want God. Do I want healing? Not as much as I want God. Ultimately, I look at it and I say that I stand on the risen hope, which is Jesus Christ. I end with these verses in John chapter 14, verse 1, where Jesus says this. Don't let your hearts, hearts be troubled. Trust in God. And trust also in me. Take with all of your emotions, good, bad, and different, that you hate, you hurt, you're sorry, you're burdened, and many people are bitter and battered and broken and bruised and all of these emotions and say, no matter what emotion I feel, God, I trust you. 
There is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, I would, would, I, 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 would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. See, I stand on the risen hope today. And my hope is that you will make that determination today to take all of your logic, all of your philosophy, all of your emotions, all of your heart, and you will intermingle them together that says no matter what I see and read into it, no matter how I feel, I will trust you, God, because I know that this life is not my home. I'm just passing through. There's something more because Genesis, or in Revelation, the last book of the Bible, it tells us he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain all of these things are gone forever it will not happen here on this earth it cannot happen here on this earth it won't happen here on this earth if you're waiting for the circumstance to get right to come to the saving knowledge of jesus christ you will never accept him because he didn't die for you to be happy here he died for you to live with him in eternity where there's no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more death, no more of all these things. Why? Because he loves you. It's his wisdom that I search after. So this morning as we have this song, I ask you the question, are you standing on the risen hope? of Jesus Christ. If we could, let us stand as we go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, too many people in this world that we live in are basing their relationship on you according to a certain set of circumstances, a set of situations of life. And Lord, when things are going good, they love you and they they love God and everything's happened. But when something bad happens, they wonder, where did you go? Well, Lord, you haven't gone anywhere. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, I thank you for that stability in my life. Because the circumstances, my attitudes, my emotions, they change according to the wind. Lord, you never change and you never fail. Lord, help us to take a true stand today to worship our risen hope, Jesus Christ. To be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and say, yes, he is able to make everything great, but even if he doesn't, we won't bow down to those things. We bow down to you. Lord, take the foolish things of this earth and use them for our gain and your glory. Lord, use the weakness of this earth to show your strength so when others see our witness, they see weak, feeble. But Lord, through that, they see you. So Lord, you have never left me, and you will never leave me. You are right beside me. You have put a protection around me. You go before me, and you are after me. And Lord, my hope and my trust is in you alone. So Lord, let me look to you alone and not pay attention to the circumstances. For my heart, my emotion, my logic, my philosophy will all fail me. But you will never abandon me. Lord, I pray that everyone who hears this message would rely upon you and you alone. Because you are able. But even if you don't, we will never stop serving you. It's in Jesus' name we pray.